Once again, welcome everyone uh, to this symposium, Engaging the Enlightenment. Um, my name is Dr. David Tamasia, and I'm joined by two experts on the Enlightenment, and I'd like to do a formal introduction of each, and then each of them will be giving a presentation, um, a 10 to 15 minute presentation on the Enlightenment. So first, to my left here immediately, Dr. Chris Bloom has taught history and philosophy for the past quarter century at Christendom College, Thomas More College, and the Augustine Institute. In May, he will begin his new role as Associate Dean for Online Programs at the Bush School of Business at the Catholic University of America, where he will direct a master's program in ecclesial administration and management. His book of translations from the French Catholic writers of the 19th century, Critics of the Enlightenment, was published in a second edition by Clooney Media in 2020. Dr. Joseph Stewart is Associate Professor of History and a Fellow of the Catholic Studies Program here at the University of Mary. He's the author of the book, Rethinking the Enlightenment, Faith in the Age of Reason, published by Sophia Press in 2020. And a second book, Christopher Dawson, A Cultural Mind in the Age of the Great War, being published this year by Catholic University of America. He's married to Barbara, and together they have three children. They live in Bismarck, North Dakota, where they intensively garden every summer and acquire an average of a book every day. <laughs> so the format, uh, the way we're going to do the format for this discussion is, as I said earlier, each of our presenters is going to give a 10 to 15 minute presentation on the Enlightenment. After that point, we'll engage, they'll engage in a discussion and an exchange on their different viewpoints. I'll serve as moderator of that discussion. And then we'll open it up for Q&A to the audience, to each of you to give you a chance to ask questions of our experts. And so first, Dr. Joseph Stewart is going to present his account of the Enlightenment. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dr. Bloom, for being here. Thank you for Prime Matters and the Catholic Studies for sponsoring this, this uh, amazing event. I, uh, so I'm somebody who is interested in the relationship between Christianity and the modern world, Catholicism in particular, right, that relationship. Um, where do they sort of collide, um, or where do they overlap? Uh, is it possible to have sort of a bicultural identity of modern and Christian, and to how far, to what extent? Yeah, and, and one of the sort of terms that often comes up in questions like this is the Enlightenment, partly because this is really the beginning of the modern world in many ways. And in the mentality of modernity, uh, you can trace it back to the Enlightenment in, in certain ways. Uh, focus on freedom and equality and you know autonomous reason and all this kind of stuff um, and so I guess I was thinking about how you know this the larger question of Christianity in the modern world if we could do sort of a smaller study sort of narrow the question down and look at the beginnings of the whole adventure of modern history and, and look at the relationship between Christianity and the Enlightenment then we might shed light on that larger larger question so Here's the challenge, though, is that the relationship between Christianity and the Enlightenment has often been portrayed as simply colliding, as, as sort of almost antithetical to each other. And this is true um, within the, the mainstream secular historians, um, you know, 1960s, um, Peter Gay, all the way up to Jonathan Israel today, you have this idea that uh, the Enlightenment was really good, uh, you know, progress and freedom, and it's the light, and Christianity is the enemy, and so that one's, the Enlightenment's good, Christianity's bad. So this is a common interpretation still, still to this day. Now what's interesting is that Christians, and Catholics in particular, actually accept the assumptions of this narrative. Um, or this, maybe this meta-narrative would be a better, a better way to put it. And that is, all the way from uh, Augustine Barol all the way up till today, you find Catholics and, and other Christians who say, hey, yeah, we agree. The, the Enlightenment and Christianity are completely at odds with each other. We just reverse the valuation, right? So Christianity good, Enlightenment bad. And so it struck me that that has implications for how we think about the modern world. How we think, if, if we conceive of the Enlightenment and Christianity as simply opposed to each other, then this has a certain influence on the way we think of modern society. Because if, it was, if modernity was born bad, then you know, that, that gives a certain kind of feel to, to today. And so this bothered me. This seemed too simple and 
I, I thought, you know, it sh that I thought that it should bother us, uh, Christian people, because if we take seriously that faith and reason can work together and are intimately related in, in the Catholic intellectual tradition, how could it be that they would be completely at odds with each other? Um, Christians are naturally part of the culture in which they exist. So I started thinking about the Enlightenment is not just sort of a, a set of ideas labeled anti-Christian, but rather a culture uh, on a way of life, sure, that involved ideas, but also a, a lived way of life, just like Christianity. And could we sort of reconceive or rethink the relationship between the two? And so what I wanted to do is, is to sort of go back in time, which is what, what we historians do through use of sources and relying on other historians and other scholars, uh, which, which I have benefited from many, uh, far greater than I am, uh, and wrote this book, Rethinking the Enlightenment, Faith in the Age of Reason, um, published by Sophia. It's really a general audience kind of book. It's, it's not nothing, nothing new and groundbreaking here. It's just drawing together other great scholars and their work and trying to present it in a, in a holistic way for a general audience. And, and so what I wanted to do is go back and ask, okay, well, what did people of the 18th century think? How did they relate to the Enlightenment? Christians, you know, how did Christians relate to the Enlightenment? And, and this is the fruit of it. This is the fruit of, of the research. Two years of writing and research. And what I found was that there were three ways, or three strategies, I call them, by which Christians related to the Enlightenment. Now, they weren't necessarily self-conscious, like, oh, so I'm going to pick this strategy. And it wasn't necessarily like that. Like that. I, I'm using that word sort of retrospectively to try to categorize different you know, responses that I saw. And uh, one of them was definitely conflict. It just can't be denied. Uh, so this, this idea that the, the, the Enlightenment culture and Christianity and Christian culture conflicted is, is real. It really happened. Uh, the French Revolution is sort of one of the most famous sort of example and case study in this. And, um, and so I wanted to use stories to illustrate these three different uh, responses to the Enlightenment. First one being conflict. Um, the second one being engagement. So Christians who, who get, engage the Enlightenment in really sophisticated ways. That's part two of the book. And then part three is on retreat. And what I mean by this is not a, a military maneuver, um, but a, a movement inward, like a spiritual retreat. Uh, a movement inward to prayer, to that place where you discover more deeply your sense of vocation. And then out of that inward move, there's often, there can be, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, an outward explosion of evangelical energy. And what I was really surprised to learn was that there, there really was a, a quite extensive evangelical movement uh, across the 18th century in the very age of the Enlightenment uh, in both the Protestant and the Catholic worlds. Um, so just like today, where you, you can, you know, modern culture and Christian culture can, can collide. They can also overlap. They can also sort of ignore each other, sort of like parallel developments. You do your thing, I'll work to build up my domestic church you know, within, and the wider church, and uh, Christian radio, and whatever else. Um, so these three strategies, uh, conflict, engagement, and retreat, structure the, structure the book. Uh, they each have weaknesses. They each have strengths. Uh, they, they tended to um, um, work against each other's weaknesses, I think. And, and, the, and the ultimate argument toward the end of the book is just that all three were, were needed and to try to show, you know, in practice, you know, with real people of how, you know, one strategy could get sort of um, deformed and it needed to be corrected, you know, by, by the other. And then, since this is a general audience book, the idea was to tell stories throughout of, of real people uh, who we can see these strategies at work in. So in the first part of the book, part one is on conflict. And so there, the opening story is with the famous Carmelites of Compiègne, who in 1794 uh, were, were condemned to, to death by the French revolutionary regime as, as traitors. Um, and they, in the courtroom of liberty, uh, these 16 Carmelite nuns sort of questioned the judge, you know, well, why, you know, why are we being condemned? And said, well, you're fanatics. Well, why are we fanatics? Well, you're Catholics and you possessed a, a, an image of the sacred heart of Jesus. Okay, that was enough. <laughs> that was enough. And so they, they were uh, taken out of the, of the courtroom and, and brought to the guillotine. And then normally in situations like this, the peoples of the entire city would gather along the streets and were screaming and, and throwing things at them and very mean and unpleasant. But in this case, these sisters who were dressed up in their, their habits uh, were singing. They were singing through the streets, um, transported to the guillotine, 
And they were singing the Salve Regina. Uh, they were singing the Office for the Dead. Uh, there's these words of welled up from their hearts as much as from the very depths of Christian culture and sort of brought the city to a halt as they watched. They'd never seen an entire community, you know, executed before. And uh, they renewed their vows. They asked for a little extra time. And then they, you know, they lined up in Mother Superior, Mother Teresa of St. Augustine, called the youngest sister forward, and, and she knelt down in front of her Mother Superior, kissed a statue of Mary, and said, permission to die, Mother. And, uh, and Mother Superior said, go, my daughter. And she stood, and they're all singing. In this case, and everybody's just completely silent. And she goes up singing from Psalm 117, all the nations praise God. And uh, she lay down in a prone position, just like she would have been when she would have said her vows. And there was suddenly one less voice singing. And that one by one, until the, the Mother Superior was the last left. So this story, in a, in a dramatic way, I think, shows this conflict at the heart of the Enlightenment. And I sort of isolate it in three major areas of conflict, one being just that religion, the question of religion itself. Um, many certain thinkers were, were opposed to, to the very idea of religion. Um, second, human nature and original sin. Um, there was denial of this, that we don't need a savior, we don't need a redeemer, we can save ourselves. And third was the question of, of reason, that the, sort of this, uh, this um, we could call it a mythology really, but uh, this belief in the superior um, all-powerful nature of individual reason as being sufficient to, you know, to all things. So these were three major areas I think that this conflict um, happened. Um, and in the book I traced two of the major figures involved in this conflict, Rousseau and Voltaire, um, and then a couple of later chapters in, 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 on conflict try to show, well, where did this conflict come from? And there's some surprising kind of stories there that we can maybe talk about later, but, but that's part one. That's part one, there's a story of conflict. Um, part two and three, just briefly, um, some of the stories here is this part. So part two is about an engagement. Like, let's just totally rethink, you know, this whole story. And let's look at the Enlightenment from a completely different angle. And to do that, we definitely have to get out of France. <laughs> and we definitely need to go to Italy and Germany, uh, where you have a, a really sophisticated engagement with the Enlightenment amongst the Benedictines in particular, or amongst um, Pope Benedict XIV, 1740 to 1758. Uh, just one of the, probably the greatest pope of the, uh, of the century. And in uh, and, and great women of the time, and this was one of the great surprises to, to me, was to see uh, the great women, Maria Agnesi, uh, and mathematician Laura Bassi, who was a physicist, and Anna Morandi, who was an anatomist. Uh, their, their careers or their institutional recognition was made possible by the Catholic Enlightenment. And this was happening in the 1730s and 40s, well before Mary Wollstonecraft and the kind of early feminist writers of the 1790s. The, the Catholic women in the Papal States, in particular, uh, were already living what these later women were just talking about. And uh, the Pope even intervened to protect their careers. Uh, and Laura Bassi was paid more than all the men at the uh, Academy of Sciences in Bologna, which was one of the great sites of the Catholic en Enlightenment. So I like to tell their stories and just show this, this uh, engagement in, in practice. And then lastly, you know, I, I look at the English-speaking world for the retreat strategy. Um, for different reasons, um, partly because the, the English-speaking world um, was, had a different kind of take on the Enlightenment. It was much more a practical kind of Enlightenment. Um, maybe you didn't have so much the theoretical reasoning. You've got sort of the practical reasoning of, of men of affairs, business, invention. Uh, Benjamin Franklin would be the great figure who would uh, be part of that. And in this new sort of business environment uh, and inventions and things, you, you have a Christian response of sort of retreat of saying, well, you know, here's what's happening out there. Uh, let's, let's go inward to sort of build up Christian culture from within. And, and here I'd look at the story of the Wesleys and the, and the Wesley household and the mother Wesley and her prayer life that then sort of overflowed into the vocations of her sons, Charles and John Wesley, who then evangelized the English-speaking world and, and changed history and changed the Enlightenment, actually, in some interesting ways that we can also, also talk about. And so that's, that's my kind of interpretation. That's my take uh, on the Enlightenment. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Bloom? Oh, well, thank you, David. Thank you, Joseph and Monsignor. And it's just great to be back with so many old friends. Uh, it's just uh, a blessed place, the University of Mary. Um, well, the, the Enlightenment is, uh, the, you know, the name is it's a bit like Reformation or Renaissance, right? It's one of these names that gets thrown onto we're not sure what. Right. Is it a time period? Is it a set of people? Is it a trend or a set of trends or something like this? Um, and it's uh, it's it's hard it's hard to say. Certainly, there's a lot of 
contemporary historical work uh, that Professor Stewart has, has mentioned uh, that wants to focus on changing cultural forms. So the rise of periodical journalism and institutions dedicated to uh, scientific experiments, this sort of thing. Uh, also, uh, coffee houses, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, Freemasonic lodges, lending libraries, mm -hmm. and so on. And what these uh, institutions have in common is, first of all, where they are. They're in northern European commercial cities, capitals like London and Paris, but also uh, places like uh, Bordeaux, Le Havre, Glasgow, uh, Scotland, and so on, and uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and they uh, also have in common a, a certain kind of clientele, if you will. Uh, it's, uh, these, are, these are prosperous as it were, laymen and women, for the most part, rather than the clerical uh, establishment. And so they're pursuing an education not in conventional university forms, but in these other uh, cultural institutions. Um, and so it's, it has become conventional to describe, uh, just in the last 20, 30 years, to talk about the Enlightenment that way. But I think it's also helpful to remember, uh, whenever we're talking about something as, as potentially amorphous as, as the Enlightenment or the Renaissance, or the Reformation, uh, you know, how it got its name and what, what seems to still have legs today from, from it, you know. Um, arguably, the Enlightenment comes from Voltaire's practice of referring to himself and his friends as lights, les lumières, okay. And then the, the name took a kind of canonical form in the hands of Immanuel Kant in a famous essay of 1784 called What is Enlightenment? So in this case, it's a German word, Aufklärung, uh, which just means enlightenment. Um, and in the case of Voltaire and, and Kant and their associates, it really was uh, the, the notion here was that we're moving out of darkness and shadows and, and into light, right? Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a fairly strong claim here about newness, about, uh, as, as Dr. Stewart was saying, a, a kind of setting people free or setting them on their own feet or something like this. Um, and uh, the historiography of the Enlightenment ever since has tended to privilege these kinds of um, uh, innovations, if you will, okay? And I want to talk uh, about two of them while also, uh, but, but first, talking a little bit about the culture of the Enlightenment. And so what I'm going to do is propose three theses on, on the Enlightenment, understood both as a culture, but as a culture that, that had strong commitments at its heart and then um, do my best to kind of flesh out these three theses in the time that I have available. Um, and we'll hope that I can stay moderate so that the moderator can just uh, rest. <laughs> so my, my three not so moderate theses are that, um, first, the Enlightenment is at the origin of the most salient feature of our common culture today. And by our common culture today, I mean North America, Norway, Brazil, South Africa, wherever you like, okay? Uh, which is that men and women uh, today, for the most part, are unsteady in character, okay? The virtues are not really at home in our contemporary culture, wherever you care to look, except perhaps in North Dakota. <laughs> I think the virtues are at home in North Dakota. Uh, so that's, that, that's the first thesis that we're, when we look to the Enlightenment, we're going to see the rise of a kind of unsteadiness of character. Second thesis is that the Enlightenment is at the origin, or we in the Enlightenment, we find the origin of the dominant political and legal philosophy of Western secular regimes, which may be characterized as one in which the good is made private. The good has been privatized in modern secular regimes. And then third, the Enlightenment is at the origin of the dominant capacity today of, or the dominant conception of the human capacity to know, which involves an instrumental conception of reason, okay? Reason as a tool, rather than reason as an openness to the being of things, and I'll say more about that. So those are my three not so moderate theses. Uh, as to the first, that in the Enlightenment, and this would be especially true in in France in the 18th century, but also true in other parts of Europe. Uh, it certainly, uh, you know, would resonate with uh, uh, some of the cities on the Atlantic coast of, 
of the 13 colonies in the late 18th century, we, we find an unsteadiness of character. Okay? And a lot of evidence could be thrown at this, but I'm just going to throw one piece of evidence, which is the publishing success of Voltaire's short novel, Candide. Um, this was a novel that was published in 1759. It became an immediate bestseller uh, all over Northern Europe. Uh, went through 43 editions between uh, 1759 and 1789, so 30 years, more than one edition per year, and sold 6,000 copies in its first few weeks. Now, what's on the inside of Candide? Uh, well, I'd rather not say much about that. Uh, so instead, what I'm going to do is to quote from a woman who started to read it in 18th century England, a woman named Elizabeth Carter, who's a friend of the great Dr. Samuel Johnson, and Elizabeth Carter, a very well-educated woman in 18th century England, she told her friend Elizabeth Montague that she was unable to finish Condite because, quote, it was horrid in all respects. And so I threw it aside, and nothing, I believe, will tempt me ever to look into it again. Now, having read Condite, and even then subsequently having made the mistake of assigning it to undergraduates, right? I, I read it, I'd been, it'd been inflicted upon me in high school, and it'd been about 15 years, and I'd forgotten how horrid it was. And mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, but boy did I do penance for that one. Because every sin against the Sixth and Ninth Commandments that, that could be named is discussed in Condide, along with much other that is scurrilous and prurient and offensive to pious ears. Uh, it's the kind of book that one ought not finish. It's not the kind of book that a healthy society turns into a bestseller. Okay? And so this tells us something about mid to late 18th century France, that the book buying population is willing to read the contemporary equivalent of Fifty Shades of Grey and read it over and over and over again and recommend it to their friends and so forth. Right? So there's a problem here. Right? What, are, what are we called to as, as Catholics? Right? We're called to pluck out our right eye if it offends us. Right? We're called to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. We're called to flee these things, not even to mention them in public, and to follow after what is noble and what is pure and what is just and what is generous. Right? Um, and these were the kinds of uh, healthy reactions that weren't dominating the culture in late 18th, late 18th century France, and truth be told, in other parts of Northern Europe as, as well. So there's, I begin then with kind of a cautionary note about the Enlightenment as a culture that uh, aspects of it, or we don't have to look very hard to see aspects of it that are recognizable to us as being similar to the aspects of our culture today that we're not proud of. Okay? And that itself means that, you know, we might, we might want to uh, think about how important it is to have recourse to the saints and to scripture to shed real light on human flourishing and human happiness, right? As opposed to uh, what, is, what is so often proposed in our world. So for instance, in all throughout the 19th century, one of the great um, textbooks of how to live a happy life in American schools was Ben Franklin's autobiography. But in fact, it's not the life of a man who had a steady character as a careful reader of his autobiography and then letters will discern. So I begin with a cautionary note. Second, the privatization of good. That in the Enlightenment, we see the, the notion of the good or the common good, if you like, being privatized. Um, now, it would be easy enough to demonstrate this by looking at writings of political philosophy, or again, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen that came out of the French Revolution in 1789. But instead, what I'm going to do is simply mention the French Revolution's promulgation of divorce as a law, the law of divorce, promulgated on the 20th of September in 1792, during the early, relatively early phase of the French Revolution, before the guillotine was chopping heads off. And the law is breathtakingly simple. It, it just begins this way. Marriage is dissolved by divorce. Divorce takes place by the mutual consent of the spouses. Not so bad, I suppose, if you could get them to agree with one another. 
maybe, right? But then immediately afterwards it says, one of the spouses may declare divorce upon the simple allegation of incompatibility of temperament or character. So, so much for mutual consent. It was, it's gone, right? Uh, this is the first and most aggressive no-fault divorce law that the, that the world has ever seen. And it was promulgated in 1792, a very long time ago. Now, the difficulty with this from the point of view of political philosophy is that for most people, their, their best and strongest and most vibrant experience of goods that are shared is in the context of marriage and family, right? A happy human life is a life in which what we say mine about is also what we say yours about and therefore what we say ours about, right? So when you think about how much you love the University of Mary, of course you, you love it as your good, right? You love being here for what it does for you, but you realize in loving the University of Mary that you can't have it for yourself without it also being the good of those with whom you share the life here, right? So that what you love in the common life of the University of Mary is something that is yours because it's ours. And it can only be yours because it's ours. But here's the magic. It's no less yours because it's shared, right? It's more yours by virtue of being shared, okay? This is, in fact, the secret of happiness, is to find these common goods that can structure a whole life, right? And marriage is actually the archetypal common good in this regard. I'll simply gesture to John Paul II's very beautiful letter to families, if you'd like to see a reflection upon this. Um, this is my commandment, says the Lord, that you love one another as I have loved you. What does he intend us to understand by that? That we'd be willing to lay down our life for our friend, right? But it's not laying down your life to say, oh, it's been a good five years of marriage. I'm going to, you know, head somewhere else now. <laughs> so the law of divorce cut right against the bone of human happiness at its very principle. And it did so as I'm alleging here, a characteristic feature of 18th century ways of thinking about human society and human relationships. Third, uh, in the Enlightenment, we see the dominant conception of knowing is that reason is a tool or an instrument for what exactly? Well, here's how David Hume put it in 1739 in his treatise of human nature. Reason is and ought only to be reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. Okay, now that sounds really terrible. It is really terrible. <laughs> it is really terrible. But it's not quite as terrible as it sounds because by passions, what David Hume meant was something like the, the joy that we might be seeking in having a conversation with friends, right? So he wasn't by passions, he meant any, any sort of impetus towards some good, okay? But he used the word passions advisedly here because he thought that all of the goods that we seek are in some sense uh, sensible goods, that our, that our passions or emotions or sense appetites respond to these goods in one way or another, right? It could be looking at a painting and enjoying that, but nevertheless, uh, he thought that this, this is where we found motivation in life. Because why, why did he think that? Because he did not think that reason was capable of laying hold of the what it is to be of a thing and making a judgment about the good of that thing. He thought reason was powerless to do that. So did Isaac Newton, so did John Locke, so did many other Enlightenment thinkers. But if reason can't give us a, a, a substantive account of what things are and how they're good, then our motive towards attaining good things has to come from somewhere other than reason. It has to come from our sense appetites, and that's why Hume said what he did, okay? Fast forward to the 21st century. I suppose I finally have to admit that we're in the 21st century, you know, I have to stop talking about the 20th century. Um, and what do we find, right? We find, we find a world in which relatively few people rule themselves by reason and by reasoned judgment about what is good and instead most people 
are doing exactly what Hume suggested. They, they are put, using their very powerful reason, because we are made in the image of God, we do have this wonderful tool, right? But they're using it just as a tool to get them what they want based on their sense appetites of one kind or another, right? So Hume proved to be somewhat prophetic in that regard. And this, this, is, this lies at the heart of today's tragedy, right? Um, what, what, what kinds of judgments of reason are we having a hard time making today? Well, let's just consider Matthew 19, uh, verses uh, 3 and following here. The Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Right, so here's our, here's our Lord with the infallibility of divine speech repeating what, of course, is... Uh, also known to us from common experience, that God makes human beings male and female. Okay? This is precisely the kind of judgment about the nature of things that today we're having a hard time making. Why are we having a hard time making and standing by that kind of judgment? Because for two centuries we've been pursuing a kind of instrumental use of reason, and we've lost the habit of thinking about things according to what they are and how they are good. Okay? All right, so I've, I've laid out a very grim... Uh, case for you here about the Enlightenment, right? That in, in it we see the origins of a, of a common culture in which men and women are not living according to steady or reliable habits of virtue. That we're, that we're seeing the rise to dominance, even in the form of legislation, of a political philosophy that, that is based upon a, a kind of rigorous individualism rather than upon human flourishing in terms of common goods. And finally, that all of this is sort of undergirded or made possible at the level of the deep, deepest convictions by a kind of skepticism about our ability to know what things are and how they are good. And so these, these, are, these are defects uh, that, we, that we need to contend with and come to terms with and, of course, shed the light of the gospel upon, uh, bring true enlightenment to the world uh, for the sake of healing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Well, I'd like to ask um, first, uh, Dr. Stewart, with your, um, your account of the three ways in which Catholics, uh, you call them three strategies for dealing with the Enlightenment. Um, the one that most people are familiar with is the conflictual. But I'm curious about your account of uh, engaging the Enlightenment and the engagement of Catholics during that period of time with the Enlightenment. And I wondered if, uh, if it's possible, I'd just like you to respond to this. It's, I could see a critic looking at that saying, well, you're presenting a pretty rosy picture of Catholics and the Enlightenment. Is it Catholic? Is there truly a Catholic Enlightenment? Or was it just simply a matter of Catholics doing great things during the Enlightenment period? And I'm wondering if you could just respond to that and give an account mm -hmm. for why you have this... Um, vision of, of the Enlightenment, the Catholic in, Enlightenment, or the Catholic engagement with the Enlightenment? Yeah, sure. Well, it's quite a question. Uh, we'll get started on it. Please, please interject as we go here. Uh, sure. But first of all, I guess there's, there's, the Catholic Enlightenment was forgotten for a long time, um, partly because right after the French Revolution, it was sort of like a, such a trauma that everybody who lived after the Revolution interpreted the Enlightenment through the Revolution. Right, so the Enlightenment created the French Revolution. Right. Therefore, the French Revolution is bad, therefore the Enlightenment is bad. That interpretation is held for 150 years uh, by, a lot of, by a lot of historians. Um, but it's one-sided. And this has been rediscovered in the last 20 years, a whole a slew of scholarship uh, from Ulrich Lehner at Notre Dame to books coming out by University of Toronto Press and University of Pennsylvania um, about the figures of the Catholic Enlightenment, uh, which is a subset of the, the religious Enlightenment which involved Protestants and Jews as, as well. And uh, so the argument here is that it's a mistake to take the French Enlightenment as A, uh, a sort of a direct cause to the French Revolution, and B, it's a mistake to think that the French Enlightenment is the Enlightenment. Okay, so I want to pick up on one of the points that Dr. Bloom made about terminology. You know, we only use the word Enlightenment as sort of a concession to popular needs. <laughs> no serious historian thinks there was an Enlightenment anymore. There were enlightenments. 
and they would have a discussion about their typology, like how would you characterize it? You know, like so Jonathan Israel talks about like the moderate enlightenment and the radical enlightenment. Um, Gertrude Himmelfarb talks about the French enlightenment, the British enlightenment, and the American enlightenment. Totally different from each other, um, but yet uh, related on, in certain ways. But very distinct and, and very unique, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, and then this typology that I've created from a Christian perspective, the conflictual enlightenment from a Christian's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the Catholic enlightenment and this, uh, this practical enlightenment that, uh, that I've talked about. Um, so I think, first of all, we have to make, we have to make those distinctions that, um, yeah, if the enlightenment is a culture and you sort of live in it, you're sort of immersed in it, then you're naturally going to be sort of looking around and, and looking for, you know, what is it in my environment that is really helpful and really good? Like, what are the questions that the enlightenment around me is trying and struggling to answer? You know, so we, we have to be very careful to, to talk about the enlightenment through history the historical perspective and understand it on its, on its own terms and not simply sort of looking at it from our own cultural catastrophe today and sort of look back and say, well, this was caused by the Enlightenment. When, you know, maybe some of the things were, but maybe some of the things weren't. And, and first of all, even what do we mean by the Enlightenment, right? Which, which Enlightenment caused those things, you know, is, is what I would say. So if we go back and we look, okay, what were the problems at the time? In, in, well, one of the problems was the connection of church and state. Uh, not so much in the English-speaking world. They'd gone through their revolution in the late 17th century. But the connection of church and state uh, was associating the church with abuse of power, uh, particularly in France, with the persecution of Protestants there. And, um, and in Italy, you have a massive famine happening in the 1760s. And so you, there, you have church and state you know, quite close as well. And so you're, oh, here's all these priests who are you know, you know, involved in governmental decisions who are failing to feed people. Like this is, you know, we need, we need, a, we need a, different, a different arrangement, right? It needs to be come up with. So what, this is one of the problems that they were trying to, um, to answer. The other problem that people in the Enlightenment were trying to answer was, um, you know, some things like misogynism in, in the Bible, or reading the Bible misogically, according to misogynism, excuse me. Um, and so this was a common, you know, a common idea that, well, women are to blame for the fall because they tempted man, and, you know, and so therefore you look through these glasses and you start looking at how all the other, uh, texts of St. Paul and things, clearly, you know, women are subordinate, um, and, and jokes about women's intelligence. It was just kind of in the, you know, in the culture, and this was a, a definitely a problem uh, of, of the day. So there were real kinds of things. So people are looking around for, well, how do we, like, deal, deal with these things? Uh, and, and so in the, the Catholic Enlightenment in particular, that's been sort of rediscovered by scholars in the last 20 years, ha has shown how, you know, certain themes, like let's say women, all right, we can talk about that if we have time here. Um, the physical sciences and making them more accessible to more people, uh, including through church investment. Um, public museums, so making knowledge you know, more widespread uh, to the populace. This was, a, this was a big enlightenment desire to do that. Uh, how do we make empirical facts and knowledge more widespread? And so the, the Catholics in the enlightenment realizing that, well, truth is not only conveyed by texts, like a good scholastic would hold, but also by things, right? This was the great age of sense knowledge. Mm -hmm. And what can we learn through anatomical things, for example, or maybe archeological things, like from the catacombs, early Christian art and things. All these things needed to be collected. And so they, the popes, um, particularly Pope Benedict, um, built up the world's first public museum in the, uh, in the Enlightenment that was uh, the Capitoline Museum now today, and also laid the foundations for the Vatican Museums that we, that we so appreciate as the third or fourth most visited museum in the world to this day. This was 20 to 30 years before Paris and London uh, were doing similar kinds of things. So there was a real faith that facts matter, that, that Jesus came into the world as a fact, he's a historical fact, this coincidentally is also the beginning of biblical, historical biblical, biblical criticism, it wasn't always that great well done in the Enlightenment, but it was the beginnings. Um, so we can learn about God, we can learn about truth through facts. Um, this, this is this empirical instinct that was characteristic of the Enlightenment as a whole was very much present in these, these Catholics that I've mentioned in Italy. Um, so, so the idea of, uh, of women's access to knowledge, of science, of making um, knowledge more widespread through publishing in the vernacular rather than in Latin solely, um, these are some of the ways that, uh, that Catholics were engaging with 
with the Enlightenment, I think, justify this, this, uh, this idea of the Catholic Enlightenment. P partly also because there's correspondence between, like, Voltaire and Pope Benedict XIV, and, you know, mm. all these folks all know each other. Right. And they, they, at the time, they don't say, oh, Voltaire, like, he's evil. I mean, the Pope wasn't even sure he was outside the church. He, he, people were urging him to, you got to, you know, chastise this guy. He's like, well, it's not clear to me that Voltaire is outside the church. And so he had a measured and careful correspondence. But nonetheless, these people all had relationships and, and respect for each other. So Dr. Bloom, could you just respond to, to Dr. Stewart? Let me, what do you think? Does he have too rosy of a picture of the Enlightenment? Or is he re recovering something that's been lost as far as a Catholic engagement or a Catholic Enlightenment? Uh, well, um, <laughs> that's not a very moderate question for a moderator <laughs> to ask. Uh, uh, yeah, well, okay, you know, ha having read much of the same literature that Dr. Stewart has read, although not necessarily the same monographs of the, of the same uh, figures, uh, I, I'm conversant with it. And, and I think here's, here's what occurs to me is that um, it's, it's always possible to problematize historical narratives uh, by adding instances uh, that are counterexamples or uh, in, you know, invite a larger or a slightly different interpretation, this sort of thing. Um, at, at a certain point, however, uh, when, we, when we start to dissolve uh, historical narratives into a bath of particular things, uh, we, we start to, I, I think, worry, I start to worry, I'll speak for myself, I, I start to worry that we might be losing touch with our, our reason for wanting to know about the past in the first place, okay, right? So if, if we were to dissolve the Reformation into Reformations, right, and to, and to problematize the notion of a Reformation and say, well, you know, it's one thing in Poland, another thing in Switzerland, another thing in France, another thing in Northern Italy, and so on. And by the way, there's this guy named Martin Luther, and he had something to say too. And you know, by the by the end of all this, we might wonder, well, uh, wait a minute, you know, uh, don't don't I need to explain why, uh, you know, something like 30% of the Christians in the world aren't Roman Catholic, and and might I be losing my ability to explain that? By, by moving too far in this direction of, of particulars, right? I think in the case of, Ref, of the Reformation, uh, I'd be, I would stand fairly staunchly for the view that without, without Luther uh, and without understanding Luther's new theological hypothesis of salvation by faith alone, right? I'm a Roman Catholic, so I call it a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think it's a true one. Um, Without, without coming to terms with salvation by faith alone, we can't make any sense out of the next 500 centuries of Protestant Christianity, right? Um, and I would say the same thing about, about the Enlightenment. If we don't um, take seriously that there's, a, that there's a hard core in there, right, that, that really is an attempt to live life without regard to God, uh, then we're going to lose... Uh, sight of what we set out to explain, mm. it seems to me. Which was what? Uh, really, a, 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 any, a, any aspect of modern life that we might care to be interested in, it seems to me, has to come to terms with the fact that um, most people we meet act as though God did not exist, right? So, so far as I can tell, in the post-COVID environment, it's something like 3% of Americans are practicing Roman Catholics. If by practicing Roman Catholics you mean they go to Mass every Sunday. Mm. I think that that's about where we stand. Okay. Now, if you want to define practicing Roman Catholics in a looser way, then you're going to get a higher number than that. Right? But that's, that's something that I find important to think about and to come to terms with. Right? And if I'm trying to come to terms with what does it mean for me to be a Catholic in these circumstances, right? One, one of the immediate questions is, okay, well, if, if people aren't going to Mass on Sundays, right? And of course, it's something like 80 million Americans are baptized Catholics, right? So there's an incredible gulf between baptized Catholics and those who go to Mass every Sunday. The question presents itself, you know, well, what are they doing, right? And, and the answer seems to be, in part, that more and more 
people are declaring themselves to be nuns, right, and not that kind of nun, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, they, they're, without, they're without religious affiliation. What's something else that presents itself about the world, especially over the last decade, but for sure the last several years, is that people who present themselves as having no religious affiliation right now, today, do so with a tremendous amount of confidence and boldness, right? in a way that certainly 20 years ago we did not see. Okay? And how do they present themselves confidently? Right? Well, precisely in terms or in tones or in a style uh, that involves a kind of reaching back to the ideals of what I'm referring to rather simply as the Enlightenment, meaning by that the hard core of secular thinking that we find in that period. So let me follow up with that. Um, so you, you've given your three theses, and I wonder, there's probably a lot more that you could add to that. Um, you trace, so when we speak about the way people see the world, we speak about a, a kind of vision, right? Mm -hmm. A way of seeing things. And today, you might say that the prevailing vision is a secular vision. It's becoming more and more that way. So you could probably present more than even just your three theses, but you trace that secular vision today back to the Enlightenment, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if um, what Dr. Stewart is pointing out, and I thought this might be something interesting for you two to discuss, is that there are also uh, so you speak about the instrumentalization of reason, mm -hmm. the privatization of the good and a lost sense of the common good, and um, unsteady character, right? A lack of commitment to virtue. Um, and, and those are all bad things that we can see going back to the Enlightenment that we now live with today. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stewart in his book and in his presentation is trying to point out there are some positive elements that seem to have emerged out of the Enlightenment. For example, um, an elevation of women in, in education, um, the proliferation of knowledge more generally available to all, mm -hmm. things like that. And I wonder, what do you think about his account of the positive elements? Um, well, I'm reasonably happy with it. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, uh, when we talk about the positive aspects of, of modernity understood as a kind of society or a culture, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to a set of theses or a set of core convictions about the way things are, um, we find any number of, of features of, of life that we're grateful for. Right? Um, I think it's important to recognize that some of those features uh, don't spring, uh, you know, like Athena out of Zeus's head in the 18th century, but they're the result of many long centuries of striving by any number of people of goodwill, right? So take, for instance, the provision of uh, clean water, right? I mean, that, that's a good. Uh, a public good, you might say, that that is very hard to argue against. Right? <laughs> Who wants to? I'm not for clean water. No, I'm just not for clean water. It's really bad for people, right? So it, it, this this is something that um, the Cistercian monks of the 12th century were tremendous pioneers in. Um, and why were they doing that? Because they they were holding, in in a kind of instinctual way, the memory of the splendor of ancient Rome, okay? The, the, the level of indoor plumbing enjoyed by the city of Rome in the third and fourth centuries AD, right, was only attained subsequently again in Western Europe in, uh, under Louis XIV in Paris and Versailles, okay? And for the common people in a more, you know, sort of open, uh, widespread setting, you have to go to the mid 19th century to find the provision of indoor plumbing and clean water, right? So these are, these are massive uh, multi-century strivings by countless people of goodwill and so forth. And at a certain level, it, 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 we, we, we don't really need to worry too much about wh whether they were men and women of faith or exactly what their commitments were about uh, 
natural philosophy or science or something like this, right? Because they were engaged in pursuing a, a, a good that is, it's easy enough to value just for itself, right? So I think that would be the first thing I would do is just to say, well, you know, let, let's, let's consider what these things are and worry about them. You know, with respect to, with respect to women, uh, oh boy, you know, we're just not situated very well in 2021 to talk about this subject, right? We're defining the female half of the species out of existence right now, mm. right? So I think we ought to have less confidence that we're well situated as a culture to make good judgments about what's good for men and women, mm. right? Uh, I speak of the Bostock situation and the other things that are going on right now. Mm. Um, it was the governor of the state to the south of you uh, mm -hmm. that uh, made a curious decision recently about mm -hmm. women's sports, right? So, you know, I think, again, I'd want to problematize these things, right? Again, uh, legalization of divorce any kind of serious inquiry into the effects of divorce discovers, in terms of sociological data, that it's women and children who suffer from legal divorce. So are we well situated to make a good judgment about these things, or you know, as though it were an easy matter to think through, or do we need to uh, bestir ourselves to a broad inquiry that will take many factors into account? I, I think the latter. Thank you. I, I wanted to get back to something that you had said, um, Dr. Stewart, and I, I hope I didn't hear you wrong, but I, I think what you had said, it's questionable whether the French Enlightenment led to the French Revolution. Was that, what, am I, did I read that, hear that correctly? Yeah, sure. It's a, it's so, a direct, yeah. Yeah, so that's a pretty, that I would, when I heard that, I thought, well, that's a pretty controversial mm -hmm. position to take. Um, when you think about uh, some of the ideas that were present during that period of time from the French Enlightenment, when you think of Rousseau and Voltaire in particular, and some of the ideas that they promulgated, and I think about the rallying cry of the French Revolution, liberté, equalité, fraternité, and the whole notion that um, anything that infringes upon my liberty uh, is preventing me from becoming who I can become. And it seemed like the target at that time, that infringement on liberty, was seen as the Catholic Church and seen as the Christian faith, and that's what led, at least in part, mm -hmm. now there were bad actors um, on the side of the monarchy in particular and, and even members of the church, but I wonder if that's a really, that's a, I wonder if there's more of a connection between Enlightenment ideas that preceded mm -hmm. the French Revolution and the French Revolution happening and becoming what it did, which was particularly a vir virulent attack against the church. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm hoping that you might say something about that, and I'm hoping you might say something about that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Well, I think it's just really important in history to, you know, to not s interpret things through what happens after them. Right? So we can't look through the French Revolution and say, oh, yep, everything that led up, you know, beforehand led up, to the, led up to the French Revolution. I mean, all the major figures of the French Enlightenment, almost all, were dead well before the French Revolution. 1778, Voltaire was dead, Rousseau was dead. Um, and so is there a connection but for can sure? Can I just say their ideas lived on, though, right? Sure, sure. Right, right. Yeah, to some degree. Yeah, especially Rousseau. And the, the chapter in, in my book is about the connection between Rousseau and the French Revolution is undeniably undeniably there. However, we have to be careful making historical judgments. If, if we look at, say, like uh, what happened in sort of biology in the 1920s and 30s in Germany and its interpretation of racial hygiene that leads, leads into Nazism, we don't say, oh, well, you know, Darwin was at fault for that. Darwin is to blame. He's, he's the bad guy. He caused Nazism. Well, is there a connection? Yeah, a slight one. I mean, in the sense that Darwin did say some things that could be interpreted, but I mean, he was dead long before then, and the way that somebody's ideas get used after the person is dead, you can't blame you know, the person for. So that, there's a little bit of a caveat there to say, well, you know, to, it's the same thing in the, in the French Revolution. We don't want to just automatically assume that there's a, you know, or the blame and a connection there. Uh, there certainly is one, but I think we have to just also distinguish between the stages of the French uh, revolution that um, you know you have certain um, ideas of, of freedom and things at the beginning that you know even somebody like Edmund Burke was kind of going along with so yeah okay that looks that looks fine the French have a lot of problems uh, they need to fix them etc but I, I would say that 
in many ways, the, the, the French Revolution was sort of a hijacking of Enlightenment ideas by a bunch of thugs who were not actually Enlightenment thinkers. Um, and took them in a very different direction than Voltaire would have been happy with. I mean, Voltaire was a monarchist. He was not, a, he was not supportive of a democracy. This, this sort of mob movement of the French, he would have been horrified with. Um, and, and Rousseau was uh, notoriously anti-revolutionary in his sentiments, too. Now, do ideas have consequences? Yes, they do. Can we find a, a causal link? Yeah, t I think we can. We have to be careful with it, though. And the care we have to take is we need to interpret the Enlightenment on its own terms, and the French Revolution on its own terms. And I would see them as very, as linked, but very distinct kind of, kind of mm. events. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Bluma, you've written your, your book on people who've reflected back on the ideas of the Enlightenment and its influence on the French Revolution. So what are your this thoughts? Is, this is true. Um, yeah, I, uh, thank you, Joseph. I appreciate that, those thoughts. Um, I suppose I come at this from the desire to make intelligible uh, certain particular actions in, 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 with respect to the French Revolution, it's really legislative actions that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. right? So I've mentioned the divorce law, which was promulgated before uh, the French Revolution became violent, you know, totally violent. Mm -hmm. It was violent from the beginning, but it was you know, still in September of 1792, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it hadn't it wasn't in the hands of the Paris mob, let's say. Okay, mm -hmm. the Legislative Assembly is what promulgated that. And the same people who promulgated that promulgated uh, a law on workers' associations. It was named after the lawyer from Brittany who proposed the legislation in 1791 in the Legislative Assembly. Uh, his name was Isaac Le Chapelier. So the Le Chapelier law declared that no workers' associations of any kind were to be tolerated because the French Constitution, in his view, and, and this was ratified into law, and it stayed on the books until the 1880s, so through various regime changes. On, on Le Chapelier's view, the French Constitution admitted the existence of no bodies between the individual and the state. So that actually meant the family, too, Okay, but certainly not any corporation. Right? So his, his view was that individuals have rights and the state has a kind of plenary authority and there's no intermediate associations between the two that have any kind of legal standing. Right? So as a, as a result, it was actually illegal for workers collectively to bargain with their employers for a change in their working conditions or wages through most of the 19th century in France. So this is a fact, if you will, right? It's something that demands an explanation. How could this man have decided that this was a good idea? Um, and I think the answer to that is to be found in terms of his commitments uh, with respect to political philosophy. And it turns out that those commitments in political philosophy run right through the center of what is most common uh, to Enlightenment thinking, whether it's in Scotland, England, Germany, or France. Okay. Can I just respond? Sure. So I think here's, I want to focus on the divorce law, for example. So here the assumption that seems to be being made here that the divorce law was somehow caused by the, by the Enlightenment. But this is, this is an example of where we, we, re, we read our assumptions about the Enlightenment back through our contemporary idea. So we, we assume that the everything bad today um, is caused by the Enlightenment, so therefore when we look at the past, we want to then find examples of that. Right? And this, this is an idea I really want to challenge because it's, it's very unhistorical. So divorce was certainly not an Enlightenment idea. There's just an, an article in the Emory Law uh, Review just a couple of years ago s s titled something like, you know, the surprising case for marriage in, in the Enlightenment. And here's what I want to distinguish between the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. So the great Enlightenment thinkers, um, they had a natural law-based conception of marriage. What's really interesting is that this conception of marriage actually can be linked to Thomas Aquinas, uh, that the family is a natural institution, men and women are different but equal, um, divorce is wrong because it hurts women and children. This is the same argument that Louis Bonneau that you've talked about um, makes. What's interesting is that he's a critic of the Enlightenment, supposedly, but he's using an Enlightenment argument to, to defend uh, marriage. And so this Thomas Aquinas idea gets transferred to the late scholastics in Spain through Vittoria. And then from there, it goes directly to Locke and Grotius. 
those guys have the influence on the legal system within the Enlightenment. And so then you find this natural law tradition, which is actually a big commitment by Enlightenment thinkers to natural law. Um, you find it everywhere from um, Hume, surprisingly, to Mary Wollstonecraft, to um, Locke, as I mentioned, even in Voltaire. But even the, the jurist and the, and the, the, the authorities on law, like William Blackstone, uh, like Lord Kames in Scotland, I mean, these guys, divorce is wrong because it hurts women and children, and there's, there is a common good here. So I want to push back against the second thesis a little bit, too, by talking about how the common good was a conception in the Enlightenment, and, and political individualism was, was not the only uh, model that was on play. And so this idea that there is a good of the family, just like there's a good of the state, is actually quite present in the Enlightenment. The French Revolution, no. This was, this, was, this was an insanity, and this is why I used that word hijacked by a bunch of thugs mm. earlier. And if we go back and try to understand the Enlightenment on its own terms, we find that the, the natural law of view of marriage uh, was very strong there, and actually these Catholic thinkers that Dr. Bloom has, written, has translated so beautifully here have helped to bring back the Enlightenment view. Dr. We may Bloom? just have to agree to disagree on that point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder. I wondered about that, um, uh, Dr. Stewart. With the, uh, is that a bit of a blanket statement to say that the Enlightenment thinkers all supported, um, were opposed to divorce? I'm just thinking about Volt. So I don't know all of their thought, but I think about Voltaire's lifestyle. Yeah, he was living in. An yeah, I didn't make any claims about that. Okay, <laughs> but people like him or Benjamin Franklin, sure. right? multiple well, affairs. I'm just sort of wondering, did that kind of, you know, these weren't people who were upholding marriage, at least in their, the way they were living, sure, and I don't know how that yeah. affected their thought. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder how strong of a claim you could make that these were strong proponents of traditional marriage opposed to divorce. Well, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, to the extent that you can read their writings, you know, then you can make that case. Did they fall short of their own, uh, yeah, of course. Sure. Um, so. Uh, Voltaire just respected it by just not getting married. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. But oh. um, but yeah, I think you have to look. You have to look at, at what you know what they're saying, and the, the the narrative that's there. That I mean, the family. I mean, you know, I have an entire ha chapter on households here because the sure. household was the basic social unit in the 18th century, and right. everybody longed to be part of a household, especially in the English-speaking world, as the basis of the legal system and your voting rights and everything else. And um, so yeah, so this idea of, of political good. Uh, was lived out. Now, it wasn't thought out as well as like the scholastics, mm. for sure, like the idea of the common good. Mm -hmm. But it was implied by their actions. It was implied and often, and often lived out within, within the households and in sort of the local political um, regimes within uh, America and Britain. And here's where, again, the American and English enlightenments are so different than, than the French case, what we're talking about. Because in, in, the North, in the American enlightenment, I mean, you have almost a medieval society that has survived with sort of mm. local devolved power. This is something my colleague, Dr. Ivan Yankovic, has talked about quite a bit mm -hmm. in one of his recent books. And so the, the political good, yeah, it wasn't theorized, but it was implied, and it was lived out. And say that we, there's the good of this, of this community, and then the larger, you know, the state, right, and then the, and then the country as a whole. And that went all the way down to the level of, of households. So, yeah, was there political individualism? Yeah, there was, but there were other political ideals in competition with it. At, at the time. So you have absolutist monarchy, you have enlightened despotism, you have no Democrats, no, in the sense of no, like, very few, maybe Rousseau to be the closest. You definitely have a lot of Republican kind of thinkers uh, who would be uh, sponsoring the tradition of, of representative government in Britain. But um, I think that the question of, of virtue as well, so the, thir the first thesis, unsteady character, um, I think I would, I would just want to qualify by saying that um, the idea of virtue is actually a really important idea in the, in the Enlightenment. Now, we have to qualify it, not so much in France, although it was. Voltaire very much criticized Rousseau on Rousseau's crazy ideas about virtue. Mm. Um, but in the American, and particularly the British Enlightenment, you have uh, theory of moral sentiments, and you have the idea that social, uh, the social um, virtues are the, the basis of modern life, and without virtue, you can't have freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't think that today, but in this Anglo-American Enlightenment, it was very common. And so I would argue that we actually need to get back to the Enlightenment to start recovering um, sanity in many ways today. Dr. Bloom, what do you think about that last statement? We need to get back to the Enlightenment to recover virtue, because that's really 
directly opposed to your th your first thesis, this, right? This, this is the immoderate moderator. The moderate. <laughs> Let's just be very clear. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I, I want to rest my case here on the uh, um, our desire to explain this or that about the past, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I think that there, there are certain events, documents, persons, uh, works of art, right, that kind of present themselves to us as landmarks. And we, and, and we, we realize, so this is not just an ordinary event. Uh, th this is not um, something that, y you know, we want to paper over. This is, this is somehow both in itself new and as we look back on it, you know, depending on where we're looking in the past, right? But we, you know, we could be looking many, many centuries ago. We might say, well, you know, this, th 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 there's a beginning here, right? So a kind of obvious example of, of an event like this would be the Treaty of Verdun in 843, okay? Uh, in which the three surviving grandsons of Charlemagne divided up Western Europe into uh, France, Germany, and the, the Middle Kingdom, right? Um, it's easy enough to look back on that treaty as having set the terms of European politics, frankly, uh, down to today, right? Uh, and, uh, of course, there's, it's not just that it's a piece of paper, right? Because there were some ethnic uh, grouping, tribal groupings and so forth that made sense of that. There was also the residuum of Roman, uh, Roman territories that that maps onto and so on and so forth, right? N nevertheless, uh, Charlemagne didn't have to have three surviving grandsons. He could have had two, <laughs> right? Uh, so there, there's, you could have had one, right? He had one son, Louis the Pious, right? So there's something, there, there, there's a beginning there in 843, right? And that's, that's I think, what I want to say about the, the French Revolution also, and mm -hmm. not even particularly the radical phase. I mean, certainly we could point to the terror and Robespierre and the rule of the Committee of Public Safety, and, uh, you know, we might uh, see all kinds of uh, echoes of committees of public safety in our own uh, recent lived experience, eh? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, even if we just look at the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen from August uh, of 1789 and go through that declaration line by line and ask the question, are, is this proposition, does it still have legs today? Is it still shaping political reality today? Uh, okay, and if so, you know, why, why is it here first? You know, where did it come from? What would be the justification for it? And so forth. And th this, is, th this is how I would approach these things. I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about pinning responsibility on one particular person because the, the beautiful thing about being made in the image of likeness, uh, image and likeness of God, is that once we think a thought, it's ours, right? I mean, I can think Pythagoras' wonderful theorem, and it becomes Bloom's theorem, right? <laughs> right? It's just as much mine as it was his, yeah. right? This is the beautiful thing about, about thoughts, right? It's especially beautiful about true thoughts. Uh, but there's a kind of sharing in error that's also possible. Mm. And so if it's, if, I, it doesn't really matter to me whether Isaac Le Chapelier read John Locke or not. What matters is that he's seeing the world from the same perspective and making the same judgments about human affairs. And that's why I'm comfortable seeing, for instance, in that case, a kind of filiation of ideas, and why I'm also, I remain comfortable tarring and feathering the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. meaning by Enlightenment exactly what Immanuel Kant meant by the Enlightenment. Okay. Why don't we open it up for questions from the audience? Well, no, that's imposing. Someone has to come down and speak in front of the... Oh, no, it just went to the other side. 
I think we had someone in the very back. You want to just come down to the microphone? So, Dr. Bloom, in response to the question about you know the goods or purported goods of the Enlightenment, you know, responded something along the lines of, you know, we should think about these as great multi-generational projects of you know many people of goodwill. And I'm interested in, in why we don't want to think about the evils of the Enlightenment in that way. Why can't they also be you know great multi-generational projects whose of people of ill will or mistaken people of goodwill or what have you who you know, responsibility for that is like smeared across history and shouldn't be, you know, narrowly put down in one point. It seems like we're sort of problematizing in one direction here, and I'm curious as to why. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I mean, to, you know, take, for instance, the instrumental conception of reason. Uh, we'd have a difficult time uh, finding anything like that prior to the early 17th century, right? So we could, we could say that uh, as many people do say, that without William of Ockham, you would never end up with Francis Bacon, Galileo, and Descartes, right? And, and I'm interested in those kinds of analyses, right? Uh, but um, I would be inclined to say that there's, there's something of a, a kind of choice in thought, if you will, that we can find in uh, Galileo, Bacon, and Descartes, just to name three. Um, that, uh, that represents something more or less new, right? Not, nothing, nothing's ever entirely new except God becoming man, okay? Uh, but, and the resurrection, of course, was new. Uh, but, uh, but in, in, you know, in, 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 in the history of ideas, we expect to see precursors and so forth fine, right? Um, I, I, so I think I would say something like along those lines. Um, and... You know, at the same time, uh, it would just depend on the idea as to how many people I'd want to implicate into, into the community of badness, if you will, um, <laughs> which is, you know, a charming thought, right? So it's, it's customary to trace uh, the individualism of the 17th and 18th centuries back to Martin Luther's theology. Um, and there's reasons for, uh, for doing that. Um, you know, there's reasons for being careful about how you do that, but there's reasons for doing that. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm happy to trace lots of things. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you both for your wonderful presentations. Um, I have a particular question which may broaden a little bit something you just said into a slightly broader question. My particular question uh, Dr. Bloom is for you. I, I think I agree with your impulse to resist the sort of postmodern move to, to historicize, leading to pluralize, leading to relativize, um, and that there seems to be enough of a unity across the various enlightenments to call it the enlightenment in a meaningful sense. My question is whether the, your second point, so this is where I agree with Dr. Stewart, I think, in attacking what I understood to be your second point, whether that's in fact what happened in the Enlightenment, namely the, what you said, as I understood it, the privatization of, of, um, of the good, and for the very reason that you subsequently brought up when you mentioned the French laws, uh, dealing with the good of the state, that there should be no intermediary bodies. And so I'm wondering if actually what happens in the Enlightenment, and I think you can clearly see it in Kant, is not the privatization of good, but rather the absolutization of the state to speak on behalf of the good. And so I think that that might be a helpful frame for mediating the, some of the differences that you can explain the anti part of the Enlightenment if you understand the state as the thing which imposes itself against Catholic unity as a kind of this secular state, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so my, that's the particular question is to push back against your second point. Mm -hmm. uh, the general question would be, and related to, to the tracing genealogies of modernity backwards, what impact the Reformation did in fact have on the production of Enlightenment secular ways of thinking? And that would be something that both of you might be able to trace as, as you can. Thank you. A swarm of arguments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, 
Uh, wow. Okay. You know, as to the first, uh, I think here's what I would say is that a genuine notion of shared goods implies that we're talking about goods of reason or spiritual goods. Okay. Because my shoe isn't going to do you any good. If, if we share a bottle of wine, in fact, we each get half of it. We don't enjoy the same thing. Okay. We just get less than the full bottle, right? So, uh, when we find a culture in which, uh, external goods like, uh, Ferraris and Range Rovers and, uh, goods of the body and pleasures, uh, are, are sought preeminently, which is to say our culture, right? It's not clear what people want most. You know, if we were just looking at 2020, we'd say people want health most, right? If we were taking a slightly broader view, we might say they want health plus comfort plus you know, uh, they want to attack their bucket list. You know, I don't know, right? These, these you know, uh, these are not really common goods. These are all private goods. Uh, so that would be my, my sort of rebuttal that even though the state is uh, preeminent in all modern forms of, of political uh, theory and practice, um, it becomes a custodian for people's pursuits of private goods. Okay, and then as to the second, mm -hmm. Uh, um, here's, here's what I would say in brief that when the, uh, so I think the net effect of the Protestant, uh, reformation is to create for a variety of forms of Christianity in which the sacraments are not understood to be the principal way in which divine grace is mediated to human beings. Okay. Now there may still be some sacraments and there may still be some conception of, of, a, of an ordained minister and so on and so forth, depending on the flavor of Protestantism. But on the whole, um, sacramental media mediation is, is, doesn't have a very big role in, in Protestant cultures, wherever we look at them. And what follows from this is a, a, a less of a need to talk about the soul and quite possibly a kind of reluctance to talk about the soul. Because if we talk about the soul, that's, that's how Catholics talk, right? Uh, and so what we find in 17th century England, Protestant culture, is, is a, an astonishing openness to popular forms of what most of us would say is just a kind of Cartesian dualism, right? So it's, it's amazing, you know, without, without the Cartesian superstructure of the cogito and all that other stuff, you, you have a kind of a uh, common view that it's best to talk about the body as a kind of machine or mechanism and the soul as a kind of divine spark and leave it at that because anything beyond that is pantheism and, and it's dangerous and that might lead us to, you know, bow our knee before that piece of bread, right? And, and so I, I think that there, there is a kind of way in which at least on, that's one of many possible ways of looking at the influence of the Reformation on European culture. But um, I think it, it, it does, the Reformation gives a kind of impetus to a world without natures, a world, of, of, uh, a world in which reason is uh, mainly a tool. Yeah, I would, I would affirm much of that. I would agree with much of that. I think that um, one of the one of the additional in, in significance of the of the age of reformation or reformations was due to the um, just the proliferation of different theological doctrines. So that that along with the rise of the modern state creates confessional states, which then uh, make it by law you have to practice religion. So it was illegal not to go to church in uh, in Lutheran Europe, for example, and in Anglican Europe as well. And um, so then, then you get conflict between these different, these different states and these church states, actually. And, and the Catholics were, were pretty much just as bad as the Protestants at this when they're, they're absolute monarchies and, and persecutions and things. And so what you get is a, you get a, a Europe that's really divided. And this is, this is part of the problem that's behind the Enlightenment, that the Enlightenment's thinkers and, and culture were trying to deal with. You had a century and a half of warfare, not all of it fueled by by religion, but certainly religious differences were a, a large ingredient of, of those religious conflicts. And so how do we live together in a, in a pluralistic society? I mean, that's a question that we still have to this day. And I guess I would just argue that the, the, much of the Enlightenment, particularly the British and the American side of it, has a lot of value to offer us 
in thinking through the question of how to deal with a pluralistic society. Because they were interested in making arguments in terms of, of reason, which is actually a, a public arguments, in term, like for policy and things, in terms of reason, which is a, a deeply Catholic idea. You can't have public laws based on the Bible or canon law. It's a, that's a different legal system. So even, even the question of divorce, I mean, it needs to be made in terms of reason, not in terms of, of faith. And, and Joseph Ratzinger talks about this in his work, and it's part of the Catholic tradition, as far as I understand it. Um, and so this is where I think that the, the particularly the, the British and American Enlightenments are, de are dealing with how do we make, we have very pious Christians in much of the British and American Enlightenments. It was not, 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 even, uh, not even very much at all anti-religious, um, except for a couple figures, like Hume and one or two others. But so very positively religious. religious. Religion and Enlightenment go together. And so how do we make arguments in public then for a pluralistic society uh, based on reason? And that was one of the great challenges that, that Enlightenment in America and Britain had to try to try to wrestle with. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen, for um, this presentation. Um, I'm, I'm stumbling over terms, um, because I, I, one thing that hasn't been clearly laid out is what are the constellation of ideas um, that make up what it means to be an enlightenment mind, so to speak, or um, what might we call an enlightenment sort of philosophy. We've danced around it. You've mentioned some of the things, but I don't think we have a clear shared consensus mm. on, on what the enlightenment is in terms of a constellation of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that first thing that I, I would love some defi greater definition. Um, the second question that I have here, sorry for the swarm, um, is for Dr. Stewart. Um, and in your tripartite breakdown of responses to the Enlightenment, I'm wondering if they're all responding to the same set of ideas. Are the, um, those who engage it responding to a subset of ideas? Are those who are in conflict with it responding to a different subset of ideas? Are those who retreat mm -hmm. from it responding to another subset of ideas? Can, can we say that they're all responding to the same thing? So could we take the first one yeah. first, and, and the two of you, um, could you lay out what you see as the constellation of ideas and principles that you could say are the ideas of the Enlightenment? Well, I, yeah, I guess I I'd like to resist even doing that, actually, because part of the contention, part of the, the whole discussion and question is what, you know, is that there, there's diff people, people today d d argue about what the Enlightenment was, but people back then did too, mm. you know. So there wasn't an Enlightenment, a single, I think, a single Enlightenment. So, it, because it's not just a set of ideas, it's a culture. It's living people who are trying to make sense of their world. And, you know, you can see certain commonalities. The, the love of the, the empirical is one thing that, that I've mentioned. Um, the freedom, although that looks different in Germany and in, in America, for sure, the love of freedom. Um, you know, just this, 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 this liberal tradition in the, in the classical sense that reaches back into the Middle Ages and even into Thomas Aquinas is, is arriving at a point of more of maturity that people are trying to deal with uh, these, these modern questions of, of individual freedom, pluralistic societies and things. And they come up with different answers. And so I think if we think about it as a culture, as a lived way of life that involved, you know, certain proclivities, it involved social kinds of behaviors like going to coffee houses, like, like you mentioned. Um, a certain kind of social strategy that it's, you can be a person of principle, but it needs to be respectful of other persons of principles, right? Like, so the Voltaire, you know, you'd have a meal, you'd have a meal together at Voltaire's estate, which would begin with a prayer. And he said, anybody's welcome at my table, but don't have a dagger in your pocket, mm -hmm. right? And so this, this sort of social strategy, like how do you be a person of principle, a person that believes in truth in public, is what the, the one of the, th the thrust of the alignment in many ways was this social strategy in the salons and the coffee houses. You're free to be religious, you're free to have, have principles, but there's a certain way and a certain manner in which you should interact with other people. And it doesn't involve knives and guns like it did for 150 years. Mm -hmm. right? So I wanna, I wanna resist a little bit. Instead of like a core set of ideas, I would wanna think of it in terms of a culture in which it, it looks different in, in Italy than it does in France, for sure. And why did the French get to determine what the Enlightenment was? When the French all looked to the English for inspiration for what the Enlightenment should be. So I think that's, that, that alone is part of the discussion and I don't think we would wanna say there's specifically just sort of a, a set of ideas that's, that's the same for across the, the whole spectrum. Dr. Bloom, do you agree with that? 
I, I'm afraid that I do not. No. Uh, my, my friend, the immoderate moderator, <laughs> wants yeses and noes out of me, I can tell. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to take my stand on my second and third uh, theses here. Okay. So as far as the privatization of the goods, I see this in the Scottish Enlightenment, in Hume and Adam Smith. I see it in the German Enlightenment with Kant. I see it all over the French Enlightenment. It strikes me as a common feature, right? Uh, it's going to be presented in different idioms, right? No one's going to say, hey, we're going to make the good private. Would you just, you know, buckle up while I do that for you? No, that's not how it presents itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the net effect, uh, regardless of the national differences um, and uh, even sort of confessional differences and so forth. And then I would say the same thing about the instrumental conception of reason, right? I see it, it's for sure in Kant, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, there in, in Hume, it's the premise on which the encyclopedia by Diderot and D'Alembert is founded and so forth, right? So uh, those are the two things. Now, you know, beyond that, we could then, uh, I think Joseph and I would, would agree that if we, if we want to add to that, like a religious premise, right, that's where it's going to get really messy. Because you have some 18th century thinkers or 17th century thinkers who are, have a very hard, fast commitment about religious truth or the lack thereof. And then you have lots of different shades, you know, all the way, all the way down. Um, so I wouldn't be inclined to add much to that uh, core myself. Yeah, and I wonder too if, if uh, one of the, if I were to be asked myself what's the most, what would be the, the idea or principle that's held in common by the very different Enlightenment thinkers? So I think of somebody like a Rousseau who thought of man in his natural state as the noble savage. Mm -hmm. And um, he's born good, um, but society taints him. And then you have the opposite extreme someone like Thomas Hobbes, you know, man in his natural state, it's the war of all against all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the exact opposite. And you find that with all these Enlightenment thinkers, a lot of divergent, contradictory systems. But the one thing it seems like to me that has common currency is the notion of reason alone, mm -hmm. right? Uh, independent of authority, independent of tradition, independent of... Um, but man exercising his reason alone. And that seems to be at least somewhat a common idea that's related to the privatization, I'm sorry, the instrumentalization of reason. Mm -hmm. Would that be something you, we could agree upon as a kind of common principle that came out of the Enlightenment that still even affects us today? Because I know Ratzinger <coughs> reflects back on that in his Regensburg Address as something that um, that we live with today, and he's, he calls for a, an expansion of this, mm -hmm. what's become kind of a contracted notion of reason that's abandoned, yeah. it's, you know, um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's important to keep in mind that there was a debate about reason even within the Enlightenment, right? So, and this is where the distinctions are so important, to just say, oh, the Enlightenment was like this. Well, no, we can't, we can't say that. We have to actually look at the differences. So in England, for example, uh, I mean, and in, well, this is a somewhat controversial statement, but an Enlightenment thinker like Edmund Burke, Mm -hmm. uh, or Adam Smith would hold that, that reason is not the only basis of, of life. The, the, the fact, one of the, the, the amazing parts about the, these guys' thought, especially in Edmund Burke, is that reason is, is an important element in our humanity, but it's also, part, we have emotions, we have a will, we have you know, this sort of robust sense of, of human anthropology in their thought, and which is why he was so opposed to the French Revolution, which was exactly holding up reason as like this goddess. That's not the Enlightenment, they would say. Um, and so in England, they, they were seeing this, this political kind of revolution happen in the name of reason. They're saying, yeah, we love reason over here in England, but we also love virtue. And we also love the, the, the human instinct uh, for community and for, and for peace. And so these other parts of our humanity have to be kept in, in, in line with, with reason. So no, I'm afraid I would disagree. I think in the French Enlightenment, yeah, there was that tendency. Um, but not in, the, not, in the, not in the British Enlightenment. But even with the British Enlightenment, wouldn't it have been something to the effect of reason, although there are other aspects of the human person that they would look to, that reason alone 
divorce from faith. No. That element. Not at all. Not at all. Can, can you give some examples or? I mean, give me examples of, of in Britain of people who did, who did do that. The only one I can think of is, is Hume. Um, right. Although he, in his grave, strangely, uh, which is in Edinburgh, uh, he has a Bible verse uh, above his, uh, which probably put, he'd probably roll over in his grave if he knew that that was the case. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, but no, the, the British Enlightenment thinkers, uh, religion, I mean, just look at the quotations from, in, in America too, who shares in the English culture. They, you cannot have stable government without religion. Uh, and this, this view of religion as being a, the basis of society was also shared by Enlightenment thinkers in the German-speaking world, particularly in the Catholic um, Habsburg Empire, where you have Joseph II and you have a lot of his sort of government officials who were what we'd call Catholic Enlightenment figures. And they would look at the French Revolution and they're like, what the heck, that's not the Enlightenment. Where, where are they going with this? This is not what we stand for. The Enlightenment recognizes that without a religious basis, society falls apart, whether you believe it or not. You have to acknowledge it. And Je Jefferson, the same thing. Jefferson went to church, not because he believed so much, mm. as because he knew that he had to give an example of public religion. Otherwise, society falls apart. Voltaire, even, he was the same. He regularly went to Mass. Mm. Why? Is it because he believed in the Eucharist? Well, probably not. Um, but it was because he wanted, he, needed to, he wanted to give a good example to his, to his employees and his, um, his servants. He made sure they all learned their catechism, their Catholic catechism, very, very well, because he said, if they don't learn their catechism, uh, they'll steal from me. <laughs> right? So this, here's the functional uh, rationality that you mentioned, uh, used, you know, used in sort of a humorous way. Um, but yeah, no, I would disagree. The Enlightenment overall uh, is, is sort of, if you looked at it from many, many different directions, you would see that a, ma a vast majority of thinkers hold that religion is very important for a stable society. A few radicals in France mm. would attack that, um, like Baron Dolbach and, and a few others who are overt atheists. And so the question arises, and I don't know if we have time to get into this or not, but the question arises, why did the most radical anti-religious enlightenment arise in this deeply Catholic culture of France? Mm. That is a, is a very troubling question, it seems mm. to me. John Kincaid is my Dr. Kincaid? Thank you both for a great conversation. And you've touched on a lot of the terms, and we had a previous question about defining terms. I'm a bit surprised the term power hasn't come up yet in the conversation. And it certainly seems to me that a shift occurs in the modern age with power, uh, how it's used, how it's understood, not just politically, but also in regards to the hard sciences. So it would be really fascinating to hear both of you talk about the role that power plays, both politically and in the hard sciences, and how that has uh, changed our world, not just today, but uh, stemming from the Enlightenment. Can I ask for a clarification? What do you mean the relationship between power and the, and the hard sciences? Well, it seems like for some modern thinkers, you think of someone like Francis Bacon on, uh, that the hard sciences would be, Bacon says, to vex nature, that we need to use the hard sciences in order to draw out of the material world all that's there. And later on, you get someone like Newton that says, it's just that the material world, formal cause, doesn't actually necessarily help us to just understand things any more better mm -hmm. in regards to the hard sciences. So it seems like you could use science, I think like what maybe Dr. Blue is suggesting, the reason, merely instrumentally okay. in the conquering of the material world. Now, that, that could be a straw man of it for some, but I think at a minimum, some saw it as a, as a tool to power. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want me to take this one on? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, thank you, Dr. Kincaid. Um, uh, uh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, it, I, I, I want to parry and thrust uh, with that one. <laughs> it seems to me that um, uh, behind the, the, the first and perennial and greatest temptation, you shall be like gods, right? uh, there's, there's lurking a desire for power on the, on the part of the, the evil one deceiver, right? What, what is it that, that Satan wants? He, he wants us to worship him, right? Uh, he's a spirit, so he's not actually interested in our building pyramids just to move rocks around, right? He's, he's interested in power over other spiritual beings, right? This is, this is the real uh, fight, 
right? The, the real fight is spiritual fight, and the real power is spiritual power, right? Um, and I think that the, the great temptation that we see in the modern period is a kind of satanic temptation, okay? Uh, Yves Simon discusses this in his general theory of authority, uh, which is a fascinating book, uh, in, in which he, he says that the, the, great, the great temptation is not to be the master or to have power over clay or steel or electricity or something like this. No, the great temptation is to have power over free and personal beings, men, men and women, right? And so the great power grabs, so to speak, uh, of the modern period are, are people who present themselves in one way or another as spiritual architects, okay? Now, there's a lot of these people out there, right? I mean, you could say, you could, you could read Napoleon that way, mm -hmm. right? Napoleon wants to reorganize Europe. He's interested in winning individual battles, for sure, but he really wants to reorganize Europe. That's the, that's the vision, so to speak, right? Robespierre. For sure Robespierre, for sure Robespierre, right? You can also see it in the artistic realm with somebody like Wagner or uh, Victor Hugo, for instance. I mean, that may shock some of you to hear that. And I know it's possible to read Les Mis and just enjoy the story and so forth. But when, when, when one learns about Hugo's personal life, uh, it becomes clear that he wanted to sell books and he wanted to sell books to support his bad habits. And, and part of this was that he presented himself as a, as a seer or a prophet or, uh, in that regard, someone with spiritual power. Right? I think we see this most of all in Nietzsche. Um, now, Nietzsche's got a tortured life and it's very difficult to sort out what follows from his syphilis and his descent into insanity from what he actually thought about the world, right? To, 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 to parse that is really hard, and it's not clear it's worth the effort, okay? But when you look at some of the things that Nietzsche said, they're remarkably satanic in this regard. He wants to be looked at. He wants to be watched as he performs. He wants to be the one who assigns new values to things, right? Um, so I think this, this, John, thank you for that question. I think, I think this is the real threat in the modern world is that uh, from time to time, thanks be to God, it's not around the corner in Mandan yesterday, okay? But only from time to time in certain places we see people rise up who, you know, Thanos figures, so to speak, to, to lean on the Avengers for a moment, right? Uh, who, who present themselves as... The, the great new prophet, so to speak, right? And I think that's because uh, the faith is not being practiced, because people aren't living with sacramental graces, because they're separated from God, uh, they're more and more open to being manipulated by people who seek and gain this kind of malevolent spiritual power, mm -hmm. uh, which is why it's a very good practice for us to say the St. Michael prayer after Mass, okay, <laughs> right? Because... This is the real fight, it seems to me. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I, I think that, um, I, I guess I would on all, look at it also from a different perspective, though, too, and, and see, you know, that the, the role that power played, say, by the church, by the institutional church in the, in the Enlightenment. I mean, Pope Benedict XIV started what is now the Italian lottery. Uh, he started it in order to raise tons of money uh, to fund um, science. And, and, and fun, to fund um, training in obstetrics and giving birth. It, it, it sort of, you know, wax museums of the human body to, sort of, to study anatomy and for the sake of art and to help preserve the, the Western tradition. And so I guess working on this book, I have come to a new appreciation for the temporal power of the church, <laughs> which I did not expect to, uh, to come to because of all the, the problems with the temporal power and the temptations and things that you see in, in church history from it. But wow, I have realized more deeply in this that, yeah, power is, is real and it's important, um, but it can be used in, in different ways, right? And, and one of the ways that uh, the temporal power, the remaining temporal power, was used by the church, by particularly the, the huge Benedictine abbeys across the German world, um, and, and the papacy, which still had the papal states, 
Um, Pope Benedict XIV was very smart, and he said the modern world is moving in this scientific direction, so we need the church to stay at the, the forefront of, of modern thought in order to help, help shape it. And so he invested heavily, millions and millions, of it, he, donating scientific instruments and thousands of books you know, to church institutions because he knew that it, without a scientific education, Catholics would not be able to deal with the, with the modern world uh, in, in many ways. And, and so, and the monks in, in, in Germany were, you know, building, you know, you know, muse you know uh, this seven-story tower of geology on the bottom and the different sciences at the top was astronomy and then a chapel at the top to look up, up to the heavens, right? So this is the Catholic Enlightenment. I'm not saying that the Catholic Enlightenment and other scholars who talk about the Catholic Enlightenment are not saying it's the same thing as the overall one. It's an example of Catholics engaging with certain priorities of the Enlightenment and saying, okay, what can we do as Catholics to, to engage with this? And here at the University of Mary, I mean, we just raised $100 million. Much of that money is going to health sciences and to engineering, and rightly so, because that's where the modern mind is at, and that's where it needs to be engaged, and that's what the Catholic Enlightenment was trying to do in the 18th century. Well, I want to say thank you to everyone. This concludes uh, our symposium, Engaging the Enlightenment. Uh, we're very grateful for you being here. We're grateful to Dr. Bloom for being with us and Dr. Stewart for being with us. Thank you very much.